This is a, a talk I gave at DockerCon Europe. Um, it was done in the morning before they announced all that swarm stuff and all those things, so it doesn't refer reference to that. But, but it, it's uh, what I tried to do was um, it was one of the opening keynotes for the conference. So I tried to sort of give something that was sort of one of those opening keynote-y things or set the stage, sort of this, where are we coming from? What does it look like? Um, so I'm really talking about three things, which is uh, I've been talking for a long time about speeding up development. So just briefly talk about that, which is the reason why Docker is interesting. One of the reasons is that it speeds up development. And then look at microservice architectures, what's going on, a few examples, uh, a few sort of category leading examples of different ways of doing this. And then some, some things sort of trying to figure out what might happen next. Um, this is the uh, cloud adoption curve. It's also the adoption curve for any enterprise IT technology, in, you know, like mobile and Docker and whatever. So you've got you know, ignore it for a while, then say no, then say I said no, damn it, and then oh no, and then oh crap, and then okay, we guess we got to do it. Um, Simon Wardley came up with this. So, so Netflix was um, way ahead of the curve doing cloud in 2009, and. This is my Twitter icon. I, somebody called me a unicorn, so I, somebody came up with a cloudicorn t-shirt, which is a cloud unicorn. So I, I have that as my Twitter icon still. Um, and what happened about a year ago is I, I left Netflix. I mean, the rest of the world was doing stuff, and then Enterprise IT was actually at the beginning of last year really just trying to figure out cloud. So I, I went across and uh, went, joined Battery Ventures, so one of the VC firms. It's you know sort of a top 20. It's one, it's one of the sort of top tier VC firms, but not right at the top, it's sort of somewhere near there. Um, been around about 30 years. Uh, they're, host, they're headquartered in Boston, and um, we have a Silicon Valley office, and we're about to open a San Francisco office down near the, so sort of vaguely near the Caltrain station um, in that part of town. Uh, later this month, I think, we actually open that office. So um, we have an office in Israel as well. So. We, we sort of have a global approach to doing things, and we have, we've been around for a while, we've got big funds, and we've entered a lot more mid to late stage things, uh, but a little bit of early stage. So I'm having this fun, fun time because lots of enterprises are trying to figure out this stuff, and um, I spend a lot of time talking to these big enterprise customers and trying to help them understand what's going on. Um, and then Docker came along last year, and it wasn't on anyone's roadmap for 2014. You go back a year, look at the predictions for the year, there is no mention of Docker except maybe one or two people that no one was paying attention to. Um, and then you look at this year's, what's going to happen in 2015, and if anyone doesn't mention Docker, they're not paying attention. Right? So it suddenly it's everywhere, and I think it wasn't on anyone's budget for 2014, and maybe it's on the budgets for 2015, so maybe they'll actually make some money this year too, so that would be cool. Um, so that, that's an interesting development. It arrived very, very quickly. And this, it's actually pretty much a case study of how to build a totally viral developer-driven product launch. Like, go study that. If you're trying to do a developer product, trying to get globally accepted, it, it's just go see what did they do, how did they do it, why did it work. It's, it's a fascinating thing to study. And I think there's been very few products in the history, you know, recent history or even long-term history, that have taken um, to have taken the industry that quickly and just got everywhere that quickly. So it's quite fascinating. So from a, a kind of venture capital point of view, we now have a whole industry being disrupted. No one had anything in their plans. It's, everything's a big mess. No one knows what's going to happen next month, let alone next year. Perfect time to try and figure things out and try and, you know, if you do make the right bets, maybe you'll make some money. So we're, tr we're all over this space trying to work out which parts of the Docker e ecosystem to invest in. So that's why, why I'm sort of interested in this. So let's talk a bit about product development processes. What do they look like? Um, people are trying to do continuous delivery, and you're trying to get around this circle quickly. You're trying to observe what to do, orient yourself, um, decide what to do, and then act. And the observe part is really what most companies call innovation. You know, if you hear a big company saying, we don't know how to innovate, it means they can't, obs they can't figure out what to do. Right? Right? What most obvious thing is right in front of them that they cannot decide to do? Right? So you measure customers, you find that there's some land grab opportunity. I mean, Netflix is literally a land grab. They are taking over the world, one country at a time, or several countries at a time. As of last, last year, they did like five, six countries in one go. Um, you see a competitor make a move, you want to respond to it, or you just observe some customer pain. You've got some kind of, maybe the sign-up flow is probably the best example. How many pisi vi people visit your sign-up page versus the number of people that complete sign-up? You know, classical. You know, you've got, a, you've got a funnel. How do you optimize that funnel? 
and take the pain out of it so more customers sign up. So maybe you're, we are working on that. So that's the observation part. The next thing you do is gather data from logs. You look at data that no one has ever looked at before. Uh, you figure stuff out. You do some analysis. You have these hypotheses. You model them. This is really nowadays called big data, which means you're, un you're trying to answer questions that no one has ever asked before, looking at data that no one has ever looked at before, which is why the unstructured sort of log processing stuff matters here. You're not trying to sort of do the kind of query that business intelligence always used to do, which is like, how much money did we make last week? <laughs> right? That needs to be very, very accurately measured, and you're going to ask it every single week. <laughs> and if it's wrong, then your, your, your roll up at the end of the year is wrong, and things, you know, that's a problem, right? This is a different type of query. This is much more unstructured decision support. And it isn't usually based on the data that's already in your data warehouse. You have to go rummage around in logs. That's, that's why sort of big data becomes an interesting thing. So the next thing that slows you down typically is your corporate culture. How fast can you decide to do something? Um, if you can plan a response, share with everyone else what, what you were doing and just do it, that's great. Right. If you have to go and ask for your VP or CEO permission to do everything, you're going to get too slow. Um, so the culture matters. And one of the big points that Netflix made a big, big fuss about is like we have a culture at Netflix that lets people innovate really, really fast and makes things happen really quickly. Finally, what cloud lets you do is deploy stuff quickly. You don't have to go and file a ticket and wait for a month to get a VM. Right? You just deploy stuff. You put it in the cloud. You call something a few minutes later. It's done. And with Docker, it's, you, pre, you already got the machine. It takes a few seconds to do stuff. And I'll get onto that later, why that's interesting. Um, so you typically do, are doing incremental feature releases. You know, a day's worth of code is what you put into production. Whatever you did that day, yeah, that code, you should ship it to production. You should not you know, like build up months' worth of code before you ship it. Um, there's automatic deployments, things are typically behind A-B tests or feature enabled. So the code you're putting into production only gets seen by a customer when it's ready and it's been tested. But it's in production as you're building it up. So a lot of testing in prod there. So this is what the, the, the cycle looks like. But you're not just going one way around this cycle. You're, you're measuring customers and you're going sort of back and forth in this. But the, the point of um, modern development, continuous delivery, very agile environments is that you are, the speed at which you go around this is the speed at which you learn about your customers and you learn about the market and you learn what works and what doesn't work. And if you can do that, you know, 10 times faster than your competitors or some, in many cases, 100 times faster than somebody doing sort of quarterly release waterfall and you're doing daily release, that's a roughly 100 times faster. Um, you're learning stuff 100 times more quickly and you're w wasting less and you go faster and, and you just get more competitive. So this is why this is interesting and this is driving a lot of big enterprises are actually starting to adopt this kind of model and they're doing uh, continuous delivery, they're doing DevOps and they're transforming their companies. If you, if you want to see more on this, the DevOps Enterprise Summit, there's a whole bunch of videos from last year. Go, go watch those videos. The Nordstrom video is probably the best one to start with. Nordstrom's a big old retailer, right? They are doing DevOps, they're doing continuous delivery and very agile way. Department of Homeland Security is probably the most fun one to watch. They're running Netflix-style chaos monkeys in production. It's like, I, my jaw dropped. It's like, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> this is, these are the people that are supposed, supposed to take you six months to give you a green card, and what are they doing running chaos monkeys? <laughs> anyway, that, seriously, that was jaw dropping to watch those guys. So they're do, the big companies are desperately trying to figure out how to run as fast as the web scale you know, startups, and it, it's fun to watch. Um, some, some are doing better than others. So then you've got this environment in most big companies where you have these silos. You've got product management group and you've got a user interface design group and you've got development, QA, DBAs, and those are all silos. And the way you get something done is you have meetings between these different groups and you file tickets between the groups. And you know, months later, you know, that one change you wanted finally hits production. So in order to speed that up, companies say, well, we're going to pretend you know, we're a big company. We're going to pretend we have a little startup on the side. We have a bunch of people. We'll send them off, and they can sit in a different building and do anything they want. And that, so we'll have this startup on the side model. And so you get these sort of prod monolithic product teams with a product manager, developers, and everything on the side. Quite often, this is actually the mobile team, because they couldn't figure out how to do mobile. Then it was just bizarre. It's a weird language. What's this Objective-C thing anyway? Um, and this weird job dialect of Java. And, so they went off and they got a mobile product manager and they got some mobile developers. And there is no ops side to de deployment. It's stick it in the app store. 
So, okay, you just go off and do that. So you have this team that owns everything about delivering a mobile product, and then you go, why are they delivering stuff every few days? You know, <laughs> what, what's going on here? Um, and, and then you finally realize that the entire company should be structured that way. <laughs> and, and the way you, the silos are 90 degrees off. So you actually want to organize your company with product teams based on microservices that is sort of do a 90 degree shift and organize your team, your management organization is based on you, this functional thing is broken into a bunch of microservices that you own and deliver and you have APIs between all the teams. Uh, there's a famous memo from, uh, from Jeff Bezos to the, all of Amazon saying, everyone will have APIs to everyone else at Amazon. If you don't comply, you're gonna be fired. Right, that was nine years ago or something. Um, that, Netflix sort of ended up organizing itself like this and more and more people are doing this real. But at the back end then, you don't want to have everyone doing their own type of delivery. You want to have some commonality there. So really you want to have a platform. So you want to build a platform team and that platform team can be outside your company. It can be you know, AWS as a platform and maybe some layers of software over it or it could be something you do in-house. I don't really care whether you run Rackspace or AWS or or, or OpenStack or whatever. The point is that th these teams are talking to that team through an API. You don't file tickets, you don't have meetings to deploy stuff. You still have meetings to discuss what you want and things that went wrong and how to make it better. But a deployment is an API call, right? Or it's a series of API calls and that's the key thing. Everything is now automatable and everything can be built with tooling and that's when you really start building a platform. So what used to be your ops team now becomes your platform team and they're mostly developers and they automate everything and, and they don't do so much firefighting. They're not responsible for what your application's doing, they're just responsible for making those APIs available. So there's some much, much clearer separation of concerns here, but it's a horizontal thing. Um, and one of the side effects of this is that doing DevOps takes about nine months because about two or three months into the process you have to do the reorg and it takes probably about six months to recover from doing the reorg before you really have figured everything out. So think of DevOps as a reorg, not I bought Chef. Although Battery Ventures is invested in Chef, we'd like you to buy Chef at some <laughs> point. We're very happy that you like to buy Chef. But, um, but it's, the point is that DevOps is not a tooling problem. It's, an, it's a cultural organizational problem that you have to really merge your dev teams, your ops teams into one team and have them work for the same management and have them be embedded and they're responsible for a piece of the site. Uh, but they have a common set of platform things that they do. So it's a, uh, there are common patterns. The way I think about a platform is it's a set of patterns that everyone's buying into that makes stuff easy to do. And, and the sort of Netflix style approach, it isn't a totally lockdown, you must use this pattern. You can do other stuff as well, it's just you're on your own then. It's a little harder to start something new and you have to build your own tooling around it. So what does this look like? Uh, years ago, Netflix was one big monolithic Java app, um, or you, know, you could imagine a big PHP app like yeah, there's a bunch of those around. Um, and you have a release plan and every two weeks, everybody, all the developers generate a bunch of code and then it goes to QA and they integrate it and then it takes it to operations and they figure out how to put it in production. Fairly common. This is the way you should typically start. If you've got a handful of developers, this is the most efficient way to get something built. Everyone's using the same tooling. It all works fine. The problem is as the number of developers grows, once you've got 10 or 20 or 50 or 100 developers, this becomes a problem because you get a bug and QA find a bug and they talk to that one developer and the 99 other developers work is blocked. It cannot reach production because you've got to fix it. This release doesn't roll out until that bug is fixed. And it's even hard to figure out which developer broke it quite often because the monolith is broken. Call all the developers, figure out amongst yourselves who broke it. Right? We used to have emails every, every other week, you know, it's every two weeks at Netflix, every, you know, on a Friday. Who broke the build? Everyone, you know, stop all your work, go figure it out. And it was a huge waste of time. And then you get all the way to ops, they roll out the code, it broke, so they roll it back, and now you have another bug. And you go back and you figure out which developer broke the build uh, in production, and you go back. And meanwhile, all this code that's been developed by all these people is blocked from getting to end users where you learn something. And that's the problem. And this was, this was, this was the situation in 2007 when I joined Netflix, and to about 2009 we were running this. And this was running the DVD business on Netflix, one big monolithic app, large, pretty much. Um, so we're trying to figure out, well, how can we break this up so that developers are not blocked? And we came up with this model where there are lots of program managers, project product managers, 
each with their own release plan, working with different teams of developers, deploying potentially in different languages, independently with APIs across teams. And it's, the development cycles are no longer linked. And then you go, well, I need to get this stuff in production, and everyone's doing different stuff, so that's a big mess. I've got these different deployment pipelines. What I really need is a way to standardize the, the release of that. And what Netflix did in 09, 010 was they said, just bake anything you can bake into an AMI, a machine image, we can deploy. So the platform that Netflix built back in 09 was you know, image the machine image, don't care if it's got Java or Python or Perl or anything in it, C++. We know how to deploy that image to production and autoscale it and run it in production, right? So nowadays, we have a better idea, which is like, let's use Docker to do that, right? So you have Docker as the container. I don't care what's in the container. It's the same idea. It's just that instead of taking minutes to build a container and minutes to deploy it as an instance, it takes seconds to build it and seconds or less than a second to deploy it. Um, and now you find a bug in one of these things. And you go, well, I'm just going to fix that one thing. I didn't block anyone else. And this, this, is, the, this is really the pr thing that is driving people to microservices. It's the unit of deploy when you've got too many developers contributing to it gets too unwieldy. You have to break it up. Maybe you spend a bit of extra time building APIs. And you have to build stable APIs between teams. But that, again, that go back to that Bezos memo, right? This is what Amazon did. They've got very effective at doing it. This is the way Netflix works. It's very effective. And other teams are figuring out how to do this. But you get this great innovation now, because one of these teams decide, you know, I want to go play with Go. Hey, that's cool. I, I like Go. By the way, if you need to hire a Go programmer, um, you don't have to hire Go programmers. You hire a Java programmer. And then you point them at Go. After a couple of days, they've got it figured out. By the end of the week, they don't want to write Java anymore. <laughs> and seriously, I've heard that. I've heard that from a few people, and I bounce it a few. It's like, yeah, that works. So you don't have to hire. You just make Go programmers. <laughs> it, it's, I mean, it's not as functional as Java, but it's actually a lot more fun to use and, and easier to learn. Um, so anyway, or you could always kind of decide you're going to go beyond Java and just do everything in Scala instead, or Haskell or something. But you know, whatever. Um, but then you can take this a bit further. Because instead of, you know, you've got all these standard things, but maybe some of your containers are all the same all the time. So, you know, I've got, oh, let's go back here. Where was I? I went back. Um, I've got standard Nginx front end, and I've got a standard Redis level. I've got standard, I've got stuff which is off the shelf. I don't need to build that. There's one in the Docker Hub. I'll just download it and run it. And maybe there's a little bit of configuration I layer on top, but that's, that's trivial. So now I've got these standardized instances and, you know, awful lot of systems, you know, a, a large proportion of them are just standardized instances. I have caches. I have web's front ends. It's just the same stuff. I don't need to change that. And everyone's using the same one, so they're getting incredibly well tested. So you've got a very, very robust, well-tested Redis instance, because the, they know how to build it. And Nginx, you go check the certificate. Yes, Nginx, the company, owns this instance, and they deploy it, and everyone uses that one, or enough people use it that it's a safe instance to deploy. So that becomes an interesting way of doing it. The rest of the system is basically the same. You're deploying your piece. But the proportion of the system you need to build is reducing because there's so much off-the-shelf stuff. And now you've got to sort of orchestrate all this stuff together, perhaps, becomes an interesting problem. But, but that, that's why I think the Docker Hub is particularly interesting. So then, what's, what's going on here? So there's uh, one of the companies I work with, Vivid Cortex, they have a, a MySQL monitoring tool that's built in Go. It's a SaaS application. They have an API server. It's a pretty large, complicated Go application. Now, how long does it take to build that from source code? Yeah, 400 milliseconds. <laughs> that's how long it takes for Go to go from a big pile of source code to a compiled binary that you can deploy. That's a very substantial piece of code, right? Yeah, mostly it's hard to measure, but 400 milliseconds is like the this, this longest I've seen yet from anyone building some Go program. Um, okay, so can my compile build time is less than a second. There go. Now I need to build that into a Docker container, and the, you know, the first time it takes a while to assemble the bit. Second time you do it, it's less than a second. Okay, now I want to run it on my laptop, so I launch it in my little container server on my laptop. That takes less than a second. Okay, um, now I need to run it in test. 
well, I need to copy those bits to my test machine, which takes you know, whatever, a sec less than a second. Uh, oh, no, you know, it works? OK, let's put it in production. It takes less than a second. It's just ridiculously quick, right? In le you don't have time to go for coffee anymore. <laughs> 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 so it's a big problem. So we have to break, build coffee breaks into our workflow instead of going away when you do a build or something, right? Um, but once you give developers something that happens at fa as fast as they can think, it's addictive, right? So you get, this is, if, if you give them this system and say, you know, it's possible to do stuff in seconds, why am I taking minutes or hours to get stuff done anymore? It just, it's a total waste of my time. Why, why bother? So this is one of the reasons Docker is addictive, is because everything happens so fast. That's productive. That speeds up the development process. If you can figure out how to test your thing in, in a few seconds, you could have a complete deployment cycle in you know, ridiculously quickly. Um, OK, so what's happening here is that we keep reducing the cost and the si risk and the size of change. We're doing smaller and smaller changes. We're doing them very, very quickly, very low cost, and it ends up very low risk because we're making such incremental changes that we're only sort of changing a few lines of code each time. It's kind of, and it's easy to back out of it. And so the rate of change is increased. And then you learn more, and then you get more competitive. So this is really what's driving this revolution. So this is disruptive. If you're doing continuous delivery with containerized microservices, that is a disruptive thing to be, to be doing if your competitors aren't doing it. And so it becomes eventually table stakes. So you've got to be doing this or you'll be left behind. So I keep saying microservices. I'm going to try and define what they are. This is my definition. Loosely coupled service-oriented architecture with bounded context. Now, service-oriented architectures have been around for a long time. People say, well, it's just SOA. Right. Well, yeah, if you like writing XML and SOAP and, and WSDL and all those things. I mean, the, the SOA thing got bogged down in a whole lot of very heavyweight stuff. Um, what we're really talking about here is lightweight um, microservices and making sure they really are loosely coupled. And you can tell they're loosely coupled because if you have to update all your services at the same time, you aren't loosely coupled. If you can really update everything independently, you've got the loose coupling right. And one of the, there's a number of things that can couple you, um, like your organizational coupling. If you have to coordinate across too many, too many parts of the organization to build a service and get it running, that's too much coupling. If you've got uh, one database schema that everyone depends upon and you have to change the schema, then you have to change all the services at the same time and hope nobody noticed that you were down for a few minutes, uh, that, that's not good. Right, so you end up with this denormalized data model where you have lots of data stores where each data store is its own like table or, or materialized view effectively, and they're all sort of out of synchronization. They're not con you don't, there is no consistency anymore. But when you have distributed systems, you don't really have consistency anyway. It's sort of a law of physics problem or cap theorem, depending on your point of view. Um, but basically, that, that's the problem. You, you have to figure out other ways of keeping stuff in sync. And then what's this bounded context phrase? What does that come from? So there was a book uh, almost 10 years ago called Domain Driven Design. Um, by Eric Evans. One of the fun things was I actually put this slide up at, at Monktoberfest last September in Portland, Maine. Uh, Eric lives in Portland, Maine, and he came to the conference. He was sitting in the front row, and I said, and here's Eric. <laughs> and no one else in the room had figured out that was Eric up to that point, so that was cool. Um, it's a very good book. The, the one caution with the book, it's a bit dry for the first two thirds. You have to kind of work your way through it. The last third of the book is where the real fun stuff is. So, you know, then, you know, work your way through, read the whole book. It's very important. But it's a great book, and it's 10 years old now, and actually I think there's an SE Radio podcast where they interviewed him with like a 10-year retrospective on domain-driven design. But the whole point of, it, uh, of a bounded context is that how much do you need to know to be productive about a thing? If it's a microservice and it's bounded, it's like, well, it's got standard APIs that connect to everything else, right? Um, how much do I need to know about Google Maps to use the Google Maps API? Do I need to intimately know everyone on that team and how Google Maps works underneath? No, I just need to know the API. It's a stable API. I can import maps. I can import my Foursquare check-ins, and I can combine the two and build a mobile app that says I'm here and I've checked in. Right. So make that the way that all of your teams work. So each individual microservice team is trying to build an externalizable API that is stable and is somewhat self-contained and sort of the guts of what happens in, inside doesn't matter. And then when you get a developer working on one of these teams, all they need to know is don't break the API and, and just make it better inside. Maybe incrementally add something to the API, but 
you, the amount you need to know to be get up to speed on a microservice is much less than if you need to know how the whole system works, right? So that, that's part of it. That's part of the bounding. And part of it, there's a whole bunch of things about having a well-defined language for describing things and things like that. The other thing is a common problem with microservices. Well, how do you decompose a big system into microservices? You know, what is the right way to do that? There's lots of different options. There's, there's a couple of answers to that. One is that management, it's really the job of management to break big problems into smaller problems and give them to individual engineers to solve, right? So that's a standard management problem that everyone has. And if you're a good manager, you take a big problem and you break it down, that, that's normal. But the other thing is there's an entire book called Domain Driven Design that will tell you how to do that. I'm not gonna tell you how to do that in this presentation. Go read the book, right? A lot of it is about how to build these bounded contexts, how to compose things out of them. It's a hard problem, but there's help already exists how to do it. All right, so these are the kind of things that can couple you. Like I said, organizational coupling. Look, Conway's law says that the code will end up resembling the structure of the organization that built it. So what you should do is build an organization that resembles the code structure you want built. <laughs> so invert that problem. <laughs> so you lay out your organization in groups, and each group will build microservices, and they'll have APIs between them. So that means that in the end, it's all lined up. The other thing is like enterprise service buses are, are horrible things because everyone gets locked into one set of standard things and you can't innovate around it. So you can get you can get overly coupled to common message formats and things. And, and it's much better, in my opinion, to have point-to-point -point messages than to have a common message bus. Um, message buses tend to also suffer from split brain and um, sort of uh, problems like that. The cap theorem basically bites you, um, which we mentioned earlier. So it's very hard to build a, 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 most message buses have a consistent view of the world and consistency is very hard to make available if you're distributed, so that, that's a problem. Netflix doesn't use message bus as much. It's lots of point-to-point -to -point tools uh, for that reason. And then versioning. You have to be figure, figure out how to make your versioning flexible and have multiple versions running at the same time in production and have the routing find the right version and have forward compatible versions. And it's a little bit more work, but it's worth it when you do it. All right, so let's look at speeding things up. Let's say you're, in, you're an old school data center guy and you buy machines and you keep them for three years and they keep the same IP address and they're still running Java three years later. That's a data center snowflake. It maybe takes you a few months to deploy it. Right? That's the state of the world that a lot of people live in. Um, but then you virtualized it and you got your VMware stuff and you're really happy because now you can deploy it in minutes and machines maybe live for weeks, then you can redeploy it to be something else for the next build and you know, well, the life's a bit better and a, a lot of the world now runs in this kind of environment where a, a few weeks is typical for lifetime of a, of a machine. Um, although some companies still take weeks just to get a machine at all because they're, you know, you file a ticket and wait a month. Um, and now we've got containers where it takes seconds and it's if it only takes seconds, it's worth just turning stuff off. You know, it's worth having a machine that lives for minutes or hours. Um, uh, there's a, what, what are they called? There's um, the, you could basically, I mean, how, there's 168 hours in a week. Now, how many hours a week are you working? You know, 50 or 60 maybe if you're really like dedicated. Um, so there's an extra, hundred, you know, two thirds of the time you're not there. So why are your machines running? You should shut down all your test and dev environment for two thirds or three quarters of the time. Yeah, perfectly reasonable thing. And then if it's running on, on a cloud, you stop paying for it. So you just say, I just saved you two thirds of your, your cloud bill, right? <laughs> so the company called shippable.com that sort of does that. They run Docker containers for doing all your test and dev environment and they consolidate all your containers so you run more of them per machine and they shut stuff down when you're not using it. And between that, they say they easily save 70% of your test and dev bill. So that's a obvious use of containers. We've got an empty slot on the right here. So what is the kind of next extension? This is not really related to Docker. Is that AWS came out with this Lambda thing. And if you look at that, that is a container that they fire up with a node.js function in it. It runs once and then they shut it down. And they charge you for every 100 milliseconds you're running. <laughs> and it's not charging by the hour, they're charging by the 100 milliseconds. Um, and they give you a million requests a month for free, every month. Not just like if you're a startup, right? Just every month you get, you get another million for free. So you can build like a pretty large scale home IoT system with this for nothing. It costs nothing to run, right? So it's just fun. I was trying to play around with that for a while. Um, the maximum lifetime of these things is currently set at three seconds. 
So after three seconds, they'll kill it. <laughs> if you send it enough requests, it will actually still be there for the next request. So it gets a bit more efficient if you send it enough requests. And then after a while, you should just have a permanent machine running Node. <laughs> but but, for the <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it takes a while to get there. So this is, it's just like the logical extension of container. Like if you can really create containers in milliseconds, then you can just run it per request and shut it down again. So that's, it's interesting to see that happening as a, as a kind of an extension of this whole thing. I mean, it's not built with Docker, but you could sort of build something like that out of Docker fairly simply. You need an event queue and, and some deployment management stuff. Um, Nitra, they just, a couple of days ago, they released Lambda. It's, it's still alpha, but it's now available for anybody. The, it was in limited release preview, but now it's in general release, but it's still alpha. So anyone can go play with it. And you know, I, I like stared at the node manuals for long enough to make it do something. It was okay. If, you're, if you can code stuff in JavaScript, you're, you're kind of there. They're, they're looking at adding more languages to it, and Go was on the, on the list of ones they were looking at, hopefully. They were thinking about it anyway. So this is interesting because the architectures now have this sort of, you're in the right-hand side of this. You can do stuff really, really quickly. So what's the state of the art? Th these are some of the, I, I rummaged around, I've talked to a lot of people. These are the architectures that I've seen. So Netflix OSS um, worked on this for a long time. There's over 50 projects now. Um, they're still doing, media, still releasing new things. There's new versions of stuff coming, I know about that. Um, they've dockerized all of the Netflix OSS tools. So you can now fire them up on your laptop and try stuff out. So that's called, uh, that's called uh, well, zero to Docker, I think. They have, a, they have a little thing on it. So you can visit the Netflix site and hear about that. So some various presentations about that. Guilt are interesting. Um, it's a sort of version of the Twitter architecture. Twitter built some really interesting stuff, largely based on Scala, uh, but it's data center oriented. And then Gilt took that and did like a cloud-based version of that. That's a little bit more dynamic. And then they Dockerized that. So the Gilt thing is a Docker-based Scala system running on largely on AWS. And then Halo is interesting. They built their own. Uh, it's a taxi company. It's thinking about Uber in London is the best way of thinking about it. Um, but it's built in Go. So they rebuilt all of their systems. So they built a, a uh, microservices architecture based on everything in Go. So they have a, a Go-based system. And Groupon and Walmart and a few other people like that are doing lots of stuff in Node. So these are sort of different flavors of, of what's going on. So what are you trying to do if you're building a microservice architect? You've got all these different pieces. You, you've got some tooling for figuring out how to build and deploy. You've got some configuration stuff. Things have to discover each other. They have to send traffic to each other, and you have to be able to see what's going on. So those are the top boxes. Under that, you have some data stores. Um, and then you've got to potentially op orchestrate and deploy this stuff. And then there's some particular set of languages and container technology that particular microservice platforms doing. So that's, this is sort of the template for any, mic any sort of microservice architecture. Um, if we look at Netflix, they have a bunch of weird names that no, most people can't spell, um, but because engineers invent the names at Netflix, so that's what you get. Uh, <laughs> so Asgard for a deployment emanator for building AMIs, Edda and Archaeus for tracking the configuration and doing dynamic changes to it. Uh, Eureka is the discovery, Prana is sort of a discovery uh, client. Uh, Denominator is a DNS management layer. Zool is a API routing tier, uh, API proxy. Uh, they've been doing a bunch of work with Netty um, for Ribbon 2.0, which is their inter-process inter, uh, system for routing traffic. And then for observability, Hystrix shows you circuit breakers and what's broken. Um, Pytheus for building dashboards. SALP is a logging system that they haven't quite finished open sourcing yet. Um, and that's running on top of a bunch of ephemeral data stores. And this is interesting because you can, if it's ephemeral, you can easily dockerize it. You just stuff Cassandra into a container, and if it blows away, you blow away the data that was with it, and it doesn't matter. The data is ephemeral in the way Netflix runs Cassandra. And then MamcacheD, and there's a bunch of other tools there. Um, they orchestrate man mostly creating new things as manual, um, rolling things out. They have some processes that roll uh, updates out across the world. I think that stuff is likely to be open source fairly soon, um, but it's not out there quite yet. And then they have all these different languages, mostly Java-based, but a groovy uh, Scala closure. And then they've got some Python and a bit of Node. Um, 
and mostly with AMIs in production, a bit of Docker for playing with it. So that's, that's kind of a complete architecture. And it's really focused on this idea of being able to distribute things globally and build a very high available, highly scaled architecture. Um, and there's a bunch of people using it, uh, all kinds of interesting people there. Suncorp is a bank, by the way, that's in Australia. Uh, got Peter's over, sitting over there. <laughs> so this is the architecture diagram. Uh, we ran out, we gave up trying to draw it, <laughs> basically. So everything talks to everything else, and there's hundreds of them, and you can't draw it on a slide anymore. Um, okay, let, what does Twitter look like? Well, they've open sourced some stuff. They have this configuration decider, but the interesting things they have are Finagle and Zookeeper and, and uh, Zipkin. The Finagle and Zipkin are the, are the key pieces. Uh, Finagle is a discovery and routing layer. Zipkin's an observability tool. Very powerful. They have their own Cassandra-like data store, which I think they call Manhattan. Um, and then they use a version of Mesos with Aurora as the, the scheduler for deploying things. And it's mostly Scala on a JVM container. So that's an interesting architecture. Do people here from Twitter? I guess we're in town. Well, there's no one here. All right, whatever. Um, thought it was worth asking. Uh, and they, they're building a very efficient data, data center deployment at scale. That's kind of what they were trying to do. And that's their architecture diagram, which looks so like a pretty of a, it's the D3 version of the Netflix one. <laughs> you still can't read it. Um, Gilt took that stuff and added a few more things. They have some tooling, which Iron Cannon, forget which what that does, and, and a bunch of other things um, for building the system. They, again, they have Finagle and Zipkin, but they've gone into uh, the ACA um, sort of Scala. Hacker version of things is more active framework. They have a bunch of different data stores. They've got some Voldemort in there for some reason. Um, very few people are using that nowadays, but anyway, there's some Mongo and Postgres. They're deploying on Amazon, and it's a mixture of Scala and Ruby using Docker as the containers for delivering it for the business logic, but underneath that, it's largely um, statically defined uh, data stores. They're not using Docker for their data layer right at this point. And they're really optimizing for fast development and very agile. So, so they're a, if you know Gilt, they're a, a flash sale site. So at midday every day, they launch new stuff. So they get a big pile of traffic at midday every day, and then it sort of dies off a bit. Very spiky workload. And that's their architecture diagram, which is, I think it's a forced directed graph version of the <laughs> everything diagram. Um, Halo, again, they have a Go platform. There's a lot of RabbitMQ in there using some messaging, although they were having a few problems with that, which I wasn't surprised by given my experiences with queues. And, and it's, I think there are good places to use queues, but don't use queues for everything <laughs> because you'll, you'll run into problems as, as they, um, when you have failure modes. The, there's a lot of corner cases in the failure modes that get in the way. And they've got a nice request trace system. A lot of Cassandra-based data store. Uh, and they're using Go with Docker as their kind of deployment model. And that's their architecture diagram, which looks rather similar to the Twitter one because they're using D3 again. Um, and then Node, there was a few different versions of this. Groupon and Walmart, both using a bunch of different microservices. Um, there's a thing called SenecaJS.org, which comes from, I forget what they're called, uh, Near, Nearform. They're, they're in Ireland, they, they built that. And that's a nice, easy interface, JavaScript. And then Amazon Lambda um, is a sort, of, sort of in the same space here. So there's a number of different ways you can build these things. And, and I've been playing around. I built a prototype um, that the code's on GitHub. I was trying to simulate large-scale microservice architectures. I haven't quite finished doing it, mostly because I spend too much time writing presentations in Keynote. And I should be spending more time writing code in Go. But I'm trying to simulate large-scale microservice architectures um, with this Go thing called SpiGo, simulate process interactions in Go, protocols in Go. And then I've got some visualization I've been playing with, trying to learn D3 and JavaScript. So trying to hook those things together. So that's sort of eventually in the next few months, I'm hoping to get something built that. And if somebody's desperately interested, I'd be very happy to have a few pull requests on this. <laughs> Uh, so far, I keep saying that, no one's helped. So <laughs> you could be the first person to get in there and really do something, other than like tell me I formatted my Go wrong. Um, <laughs> that's the only pull request I've had so far. I forgot to run Go format once. Um, so when you're doing web scale, there's these characteristics are that your brand new services are relatively infrequent things. It means a new project started. 
Um, but you're deploying new versions of those things over and over and over again. So you, need, you don't need general purpose orchestration that can deploy everything. You very rarely deploy all of the things that make up Netflix into a new data center. It happened sort of once in 2013 when they went east and west coast. They had to kind of stand up everything in Oregon that was the same as, as, as Virginia. But that's one time, right? Um, but we're using hundreds of microservices. Everything's customized. It's that the orchestration is all about getting a new version out by, for hundreds of developers all the time. And there's lots of nice orchestration they've built to do that. But it's a, it's, it's a different kind of problem than the general purpose orchestration. So what's coming next? Well, one of the things is, if you look, go to Docker Hub and you download you know, Redis, great. That's, that's helpful. Um, but if you want to download an entire application, let's say you, I, I'm an Internet of Things supplier and I need a back end. And maybe in the future sometime, there's an Internet of Things app on, the, on some future version of the Docker Hub, sort of, sort of go with me here. Pretend that it's kind of like the Apple apps, iOS app store. You click a button and it's going to charge you $10 an hour or something while you run this thing. And what it's going to install is sort of a, an API front end for collecting data from your Internet of Things written in Node or something. And then it's going to store that in some Cassandra or React or whatever back end. And then it's going to have a, an analytics thing with a bunch of you know, Hadoop and Spark or something. Uh, and a mobile backend that can you can that your customers can then see their things right. Those are the that's a generic Internet of Things bundle, right? But let's assume that's one click, right? How do you deploy that? But it because it's all standard components and a few bits of glue, you could install that in your own premises, on Amazon, on Rackspace, on Google, on Azure, anywhere, right? It doesn't matter because it's a so now we potentially we end up with a a single global app store with interestingly complicated applications. But what does it take from saying, I want this, so like installing one piece of code on your phone, right? This is probably tens of auto-scaled you know, you know, containers need to be orchestrated and connected up in the right way to make up that application. So that's a different kind of orchestration. I mean, you could kind of code it up in Fig or something to, be, to lay it all out. Um, but that's the interesting problem, that you could be build those kinds of things and, and then maybe Docker could make some money off, you know, like Apple makes money off the App Store. So that's a potential way for you know, in-app purchases and, 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 and things like that. So this is my kind of future prediction for what one place. I mean, it may, we may never get there, but it's at least one place that we may end up. So you need orchestration that can orchestrate installation of a complete thing that in a place where it's never been before, with all the logging and automation, you know, all the things you'd need around that. Tens of microservices seems fairly typical. It's probably not tens of thousands like Netflix is, but it's sort of tens of things. Um, and you could end up with an enterprise app store. I mean, there are already places that are sort of app stores. You know, VMware has one, and, and Amazon has one, and Chef has one, and Red Hat has one. And Everyone has one, and nobody. there's really nothing in any of them. And there are a few things. But if you have one central place that goes across all those platforms, it becomes much more powerful. So that, that, the idea of having one central app store. If you remember when, in the old days when you had like a Verizon BlackBerry and there was the Verizon app store with like three crappy apps you didn't want to install in it. So that's where we are now. Right? We haven't got to the point where there's the iOS and Android app store with more stuff than you could possibly find you know, or, or download. Right? So these next generation applications, um, we haven't really figured out what the tooling is. The configuration system, not quite sure who's going to win here. What's the discovery? What's, what's, the, what's the service discovery model? Um, how do you route stuff between them? Maybe it's Weave or Socket Plane or whatever, or, or the, the, the Docker stuff. Um, how do you do observability? Maybe that's a rancher or something. You know, there's a lot of people working along these things. And then the data stores. Um, ephemeral data stores, like you know, just run Cassandra in a container. If you lose the container, you just start another one, and it'll suck its data from the other containers. And that works well enough for Netflix to run, so that's at least plausible. Um, orchestration, which is what Cluster HQ are doing. You know, yeah, I'm deploying a container uh, with its store here, and I want to move it, so I want that data to be persistent and move it around. Um, or database as a service, using Aurora, which is the MySQL as a service thing that, that Amazon has now, or DynamoDB, or the Google equivalents, or the uh, Microsoft equivalents. You, know, you just access a database and don't worry about it. So there's a number of ways of doing that, and different people will use different w ways. And then lots of different orchestration choices at the moment. There's sort of a battle going on 
between all the people saying, well, I have the orchestration. No, I have another way of doing it, and who's going to win there? Um, and then, you know, assembling components. How do you develop these components? How do you test it? How do you make sure it really does run on Google and Rackspace and Amazon and on your data center without actually having to test that every time, right? So, so this is rapidly evolving, and one of the fun things about uh, playing in this space right now. Uh, just to wrap up then, there's a, a few things uh, sort of looking forward. One is that um, almost everything that I see that's new is written in Go, maybe three quarters of the new projects I see. Um, I'm not saying you should write everything in Go, it's just like I'm just observing that people are writing stuff in Go. There's a bit of Scala, there's a few other things kicking around, but it's really taken over as the language that new things are being written in, um, and just, just to state that. Um, and so there's something going on in that ecosystem. Uh, this is what's happening in enterprise. This is a book that's finally hit the presses. You can go and get a copy of this now, Lean Enterprise. Um, enterprises are adopting continuous delivery DevOps and Lean Startup at scale. That is a fantastic opportunity for companies in the enterprise IT space to sell into these people because they're trying to solve these problems. We're right here. They're desperate for solutions in this space, and that, that's a fun opportunity. Uh, and finally, just the whole monolithic versus microservices. It, it, every time you go to a software architecture conference, like half the talks mention microservices now. It's becoming to the point where it's like, do you really want another microservice talk? Well, it turns out the people in the audience want it, so you know, we try not to get bored of it too soon. As a, you know, these names wear out a little bit sometimes. Um, so it's sort of a buzzword. Um, I think at one point last year, before it really became a buzzword, I was at a QCon London or something, and it turned out the architecture track, we were all talking about, nobody had uh, put microservices in their title, but that was all we were talking about. <laughs> so it's okay, this has arrived. Um, all right, this is the last slide I've got. Uh, I'm at Battery Ventures, which is battery.com, adrianco at battery.com if you want to email me, or my Twitter handle is also adrianco. Um, I have a blog at Perfcap, which is, well, ben doesn't get updates very often. Lots of stuff in SlideShare. And I've done a bunch of talks this year, and there are videos of these things and different subjects. If you're interested in cost optimization, I have a whole separate presentation on that that I've done as well. OK? And uh, maybe Luke can come up too, and we can sort of take some questions to, to wrap up. OK? Yeah? So as you break a monolithic service into different microservices, as far as designing that goes, uh, how would you deal, or what was your experience with uh, you know, building you know, clustering or AK, for example, within that microservice? And as you start looking at you know, traditional load balancing, firewall, now would that be better off handling, handled at the microservice layer, or is that a shared service um, that you create? Um, it's OK. You so the question about how do you incrementally get there, really? Um, how do you incrementally get to microservices? So the, the, there's sort of two pieces of this. One big piece of it is the back end, right? So you've got, if you have a monolithic data store behind your system, you have to figure out how to break it up. Yeah. So you take an individual table or materialize. I mean, typically, the, you know, your, your MySQL is like a, a dumping ground for everything that anyone wanted to put in there. There's a bunch of unrelated stuff in there. So you take something that really is an unrelated piece of the schema, split it off, put it in its own cluster, run it on some NoSQL thing that is just like a single table. Right, a single single view. It's much e it, and and run one of those. So run lots and lots of database backends. So and then put in front of that put a a uh, data access layer service, and then never access the database directly. So there's only one service that ever talks to the database, and that's the data access layer for that thing. All other traffic is a REST call into that service. Right. So it's a stash, the storage tier uh, as a service over HTTP. <laughs> Stash, with two A's, uh, is, a open, is a, one of the projects that Netflix built that does that. It's got MySQL and Cassandra backends, and it's a REST front end that talks to both. So what you can do is take your existing system, put a, a REST web service in front of it, and make, change your existing business logic to use that instead. And now you're still talking to the one backend, but now you can split off that code without, uh, because everyone's going through a web service to get to it. So there's, there's this sort of step-by-step -step layer of splitting up the back end. The front end is it's a similar problem. You have to split things off. Um, 
what you actually do is put in a, the web, a, a API proxy tier. So in front of your web server or your API server, whatever monolithic app you've got, you put uh, Zool, which is the Netflix thing, or Apogee, or, or something like that, um, and you start splitting up the traffic. So at first it's a pass through. Then you say, well, if you hit this URL, go to this web service. If you hit this URL, go to this web service. So now you've got a bunch of web services, each handling a single URL, sub, sub URL. But it looks like one endpoint. Well, it is one endpoint at the proxy tier. And you can do authentication. You can rewrite things. You can do A-B testing. You can do you know, version management and play all kinds of games because you now have an abstraction. And if you're building something from scratch, the first thing you should build is an API proxy tier before you build anything else. You just stand up an API proxy that fakes out an entire API with, uh, with dumb, you know, fixed returns for everything. And then you can build the client that talks to that while you're building the individual services that make each of the return values actually dynamic instead of fixed. And then you end up lots of little microservices. So that's that, those two kind of layers. So it's, inter you know, it's like soft computer science, right? Add layers of abstraction until you've solved the problem, right? So <laughs> add, add another layer of abstraction. <laughs> yes, I know there's an extra hop through the network. You know, it's another half millisecond of network traffic or whatever, you know, and you've got to go through it. So yeah, it makes things slightly slower, but the flexibility you get and the agility you get pays back. Right. So that's, that's the, the trade-off. Yeah. You had a slide in there showing the split between uh, development and uh, operations operating as a platform service, but you had uh, DBAs in the development side as opposed to operations. Is there particular advantage to that or reason for that? You, you can draw them on either side. Um, I tend to think of like whoever owns the schema. Uh -huh. the, the schema for an application is part of the application, really. Like the raw, I mean, it, the, you can think of the DBAs as either open, you know, someone's imposing an, a schema on me and I just have to make it work right by adding the right indexes and making sure my SQL or Oracle is happy, right? So that's a DBA role. Um, or you can have, well, you know, I'm really going to design the schema for this application, which is sort of a back-end developer role. So yeah, you can draw it on either side, really. It, okay, so it's not particularly a, an issue. I mean, if you have some, if you have a NoSQL database, that's key values, like there isn't really a schema there anyway. It's pretty simple. There are some patterns you can use or, or you know, to make um, something like Cassandra, for example. It's a, there's a, there's a f things you can do that are bad or good, but it's relatively simple. Okay. We, one of the examples I had was we had a team migrate from MySQL to Cassandra, and they're very worried about it because they had all these complicated things they wanted to do. When they actually did it, it says, is that all there is? <laughs> it really doesn't do very much, does it? Yeah, it didn't take very long to figure that out. No, okay, oh, that's, all right, oh, we can figure this out. We can build on top of it. But they were really worried that they were learning, had to learn something as complicated as, you know, my, uh, SQL is a complicated language, it's a long time to learn. Yeah, you know, what Cassandra can do or what React can do, it really doesn't do much. <laughs> so it's actually very simple to learn. So the transition to it's actually easier than most people think, but you have to give up transactions and asset and all that stuff that they've been telling you, telling you should have in college. You have to just unlearn all that stuff, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you just wasted a year in your uh, CS degree. <laughs> in the back there. Um, so I imagine this falls in the, the observability bucket, but obviously with the proliferation of services, traceability is the, in, in the context of something goes really wrong, right? There's something yep. like that for which then led me to thinking, okay, well, standardized logs, if you do have all these microservices, do you then have shared models to make sure all of them, you know, log in a consi consistent uh -huh. yep. way and, and then tracing, and then what's the interaction between kind of the shared model of being between the and, and the microservices? Yeah, so the question's about when you've got all these microservices talk to each other, how do you have a shared model? Uh, the Netflix approach for that was we're mostly using Java code. We're mostly using the same code. The ribbon is the client-side code, and um, I think carry-on is the server-side code. So everyone's using the same basic code base. So you can instrument the, the things that everyone, the reusable components. So the reusable component knows how to talk to another service is instrumented. So you don't have to think about it. You just call that code, and the instrumentation's baked into it. Uh, Zipkin and uh, Finagle from, is the same thing. It's pre-instrumented, and they log in a standard way. The Netflix code has a standard uh, annotatable object. 
Right? It's, there is one object that gets logged. And what that means is that when you finally look at that object, it flows into sort of Kafka and Hadoop and whatever. The column names are very stable. They're well, well, well defined because the, ob the Java object defines the column names. And they're not all populated by everybody, but, they are, but if, if this thing exists, it has one name. So you can build tooling that works across all the tools for, for that reason, right? So, th so those, are, those are some of the tricks. Either use a standard annotatable object if you've got more generic things going on, or um, just bake it into the tooling to do it. Visualizing that is the other problem. As I showed you all those like, you know, you know, Death Star diagrams, as I call them, as like just a big round blob, right? It's still hard to figure out how to visualize. But if you're looking, but from the, the bounded context of one developer, I have my block of code. It has, you know, 10 dependencies uh, and five consumers. So I have a blog in the middle and I have, you know, things, and, and that's it. That is my world. I don't care what, what it, the other hundreds of services and consumers and dependencies are. My world is, I have five people that use my code, and I depend on 10 other people, and that's all I need to know about. And that is a bounded context for the developing one it's, thing. It's, it's dev time, but it, and I understand, you know, and that puts you know, a lot harder than you get to us, but I'm just wondering, OK, fine. Nobody will ever understand the global view of the system. Get it. Well, I was <laughs> trying to. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that the overall architect for it, I was staring at App Dynamics going, what the hell's going on right, here? But, <laughs> but I'm talking more on the need when something does go oh, wrong. The trace, of, you know, I don't need the entire flow. I need that trace yeah. through this request upon this request upon this request, right? Yeah. So the end-to-end -end tracing is something that uh, the Zipkin tools have things that will show you that. The SALP tool that I mentioned Netflix built, they've talked about it in public. They haven't open sourced it yet, but it uses the Netflix tracing and basically gives you those views. Um, a lot of the tools out there are, are working towards building that. Um, part of what I'm doing with playing around with my D3 stuff is to try and find ways to visualize that a bit more. So it's, it's, I think it's emerging. Um, these systems, after a little while, have hundreds of microservices. You know, uh, Gilt had 450, Netflix has 600, Groupon has or whatever, five, 600. Yeah, you know, it's normal to have somewhere between 500 and 1,000 microservices to deal with, which is more than you can really render in one screen. So you have to find a way to visualize that that shows you just the stuff you care about and hides everything else. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the sort of emerging things. I'd say that's kind of, in terms of monitoring and visualization, that's sort of bleeding edge is how to do that. And there is, there's some, some interesting work to be done there. And on our side, it's probably just worth mentioning a project on our GitHub called Elliot. Um, the tagline for that is logging and storytelling. Uh, it's uh, my uh, colleague Itamar uh, manages that. And it, the idea is that you can do tracing across process boundaries and across services. Um, and uh, the way it works is it sort of builds up a tree structure of the events that happened, and then you can pipe that into an ELK stack and get visibility into what happened across a distributed system. So that's kind of useful. Yeah, the Netflix uses the uh, Elasticsearch as well. It isn't always a tree. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's problems that there are, are services calling each other and like calling someone else that calls back. Mm -hmm. It turns out that it isn't a it isn't a direct acyclic graph. There are cycles in it, and it's. There's all sorts of, it shouldn't really, and I complained against the people that doing it, but they still did it, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it turns out things get messy. <laughs> yeah. I hope this isn't too specific, but the, um, moving from monolithic where you have access to the layer that's, that you can kind of gatekeep, how do you move to microservices where the services need to know access control about something else, or another service? Is there the access control side of it? Yeah. Um, well, there's, there's sort of one answer for AWS and, uh, and, and clouds and another answer for data centers, right? So it, it, if you have uh, the standard pattern that Netflix used was that for every service, every app name, there was, a there was a security group with the same name. So whenever you create a service, you also create a security group with the same name. It's the tooling just does it for you. And that service trusts anything that is in that security group. Right, so in order to call a service, you have to join the security group that is the same name as the service. So call service A, I have to be in security. So if I'm running security service A, I look at security group A and I see there are four entries in there. Those are the only four people that could possibly be calling me because the network won't let anyone else in. So you get a, a um, min, uh, least privilege 
sort of approach to the network flows in the system. And it's a very locked down system. I mean, if you also use key stores to encrypt everything, and the Amazon has a key store so you can download keys and manage keys very carefully, you're very fine grained keys. And I can use individual keys for encrypting particular types of data and I can check out just the keys I need for that kind of data. And then you have uh, IAM roles, identity access management, where you, uh, where you only have permission to do the few things you're supposed to be doing. So you can build up an entire system where everything that's happening in the system is based on least privilege. And it's, you can automate that to the point where it doesn't become a pain in the neck to do that. I mean, if you try doing that normally, it would drive you crazy. Right? And it, this way it doesn't normally happen. You build, oh, let's just build a nice crunchy perimeter that's hard, you know, harden our perimeter and we can just mess around with the stuff in the middle. But what this way, every individual machine is, is like a marble, you know, like a bag of marbles. Like you, you break into one which is hard and you find you've broken into, and then the machine disappears an hour later anyway because it's dynamic, it's an autoscaler <laughs> and, and you're done. Or if you broke into a machine running Lambda, like it's gone in three seconds, that's completely, <laughs> <laughs> you want to build a totally secure architecture, do it all with Lambda. It's like, it's like, I don't see how you could possibly get break in and do anything at all with that. It's so locked down. You have to have security groups and IAM roles to talk, to invoke things back and forth. So I think there's the ability to build extremely highly secure and resilient systems because it's programmable infrastructure and because you can automate all of the hard work of setting it up that way into the, into the platform. And some platforms are doing that a bit, like AppSera kind of do that sort of stuff. Uh, but most people haven't really got there yet. Uh, I'd say that's the way most of Netflix is architected, is with that kind of mindset. Um, but if you wanted to build something like that in, in, a, real, in a normal data center, you'd be a lot of tooling to, to go do it. And it's sort of baked into the way that, I mean, uh, most of the big cloud vendors have that kind of model already. I think, if you, so the question is about, does this, does, is microservices helpful with small teams? I think um, it's definitely needed at scale. And it also helps you get speed. So if we're a small team, like, you know, do you want to configure and build your own Nginx? Or do you want to just download it off Docker Hub? Right, so that's now a microservice and it's you know, a separate thing. And you, maybe you've got some you know, an Nginx Redis with the standard off the shelf things that you, the building blocks, you don't need to curate them and hand build them anymore. They're containers, you run them, and then you run your code in the middle. And your code might be monolithic to start with because there's only a handful of you building it. But uh, once it stabilizes and you want to add a new feature, do you want to destabilize your existing code base or do you want to start a new code base in a new process, in, in a new container that has the new code in it? So as soon as you start versioning, any ra rapidly versioning things, you want to use containers to manage the versioning. You want to have all the old versions, in stable versions in containers that are immutable, that don't change. And then you put your new code that's, you know, that's flaky maybe, because you've only first just finished writing it, in a new container. You don't combine those into one code base and try and deploy that, because then your, your changes destabilize the, the, the old stuff. That's part of being able to run fast. It's like running fast with scissors but without hurting yourself somehow. I don't know, maybe the analogy got a bit lost, but you know, it's not, it, it's, it makes it safe to go really fast because you're always deploying immutable containers with the new stuff in it, and the old stuff's still there. Whoa. So the microservices sort of helps you go faster, even with a small team. And, and my, my model is really that a, cont that a microservice is really like one person's work. It's not this two pizza team thing, that's like a whole product. Right, it's the two pizza team, the sort of the, the Amazon approach. But an individual container should be one person's work and you need to code review it with someone else so that you can, because you're responsible for it in production. <laughs> if it breaks, you'll get a call and you want to go on holiday occasionally or sleep or something. So um, you want somebody else to be able to take over managing it. So you tend to buddy and pair program with somebody else from the point of view of not of like pair programming and coding point of view, but in terms of code review, and support. So there's usually a few people that know how any particular thing works. One primary writer and a few people that are reviewers that can fix it and operate it and know what state it's in. 
and, the, and you buddy up in teams that way. So that's, that's kind of the model that works. And I think that scales down to just a handful of people. The com the, so the complexity of managing the bits is really a platform problem. And in 2009, Netflix had to build its own platform from scratch. There was not a platform that would do what we wanted to do. Nowadays, the platforms, you just, you know, I just showed you a bunch of them. Download, with, pick your language, download the one you want. If you want to write code in Scala, go, go download stuff from Twitter and Gilt. <laughs> right, if you want to write stuff in Node, go download the Node stuff, you know, whatever. If you want to do you know, the Netflix or, or Cloud Foundry or what a, or, or the Docker sort of environment you can use, you know. The, there's, there's, the platforms now support stuff, right? So you, you're basically, um, even with a very small team, you're standing on the shoulders of giants kind of thing. There is an awful lot of stuff that's already been done that's pretty solid that you can stand on. So it's getting more and more productive and easier to build things. Yeah? What are the most successful approaches to interface versioning? Uh, the most successful approach is to interface versioning. Um, versioning, it's, versioning is one of the things where there is no good way of doing it, but there are some less bad ways of doing it. <laughs> there are many, usually, uh, you can get a huge arguments over the right ways to do versioning. Um, there's a whole long discussion over that. The, so if you, look at, if you look at the sort of the REST interface into a service, the first thing somebody will do if they see a REST interface is build a little piece of code that knows how to decode that REST interface. Then they'll give it to their friends. The next thing you know, you have a client library. Even if you didn't want a client library, because it's supposedly self-describing, uh, you end up with a client library anyway. So if you're building an interface, build the client library as well. <laughs> right, so my first like, rule is that even if you, it's supposed to be self-describing, you will, at least in one language, build a client library that does the proper um, error handling and knows how to um, encode and decode the payload, right, in some efficient way. And it should basically be self-contained and have no additional, it shouldn't drag in lots and lots of dependencies. It should be a very self-contained sort of POJO or <coughs> if it's Java or something like that. So do that, and then everyone will copy that library if they need a different language, right? But, and then the, the act of using an interface is that you import that library, right, in your build, and that's it. You're, you're kind of done. Um, and then well, if you don't trust the library, you need to wrap it in I don't trust you, which is what the reactive model is. So you wrap it in a circuit breaker, run it in its own thread. If this is sort of the Java model that Netflix has. So you wrap it in a circuit breaker, you fire it. So I don't trust you, so I'm going to just run you on your own thread. I'm going to ask you to do something. If you don't do it, I'm going to sort of shoot you and move on and do something else. And flip the circuit breaker saying this thing isn't working anymore. And then point the finger at the downstream thing that is now if officially broken. And it may, be the ups it may be the client library that's broken, but something's broken. So this is the, that's the, the model that evolved over a year or two at Netflix for doing that. Um, the versioning itself, there's lots of ways of versioning an interface. You can put stuff in headers, you can put stuff in the URL, and people argue about the right way to do that. And I think it's done just about every possible way in most code bases. <laughs> so that's, so hopefully that helps. <laughs> It's a role for software-defined networks. Um, in some senses, so SDN is the sort of data center people trying to build VPC <laughs> and things like you know, virtual private cloud kind of stuff. You know, you can provision dynamically with software all of those things that used to have to kind of poke at the Cisco UI to do, right, or command line. So you want to be able to automatically deploy you know, VLANs and subnets and, and layers of, of protection and things like that. Um, it's, it's somewhat orthogonal to the microservice space. The way, I, the way that um, so microservices, if you've got security groups, you basically are programming a firewall at every level. So instead of having one firewall and, and two VLANs between them, you just start deploying individual things. Um, if you're using something like Weave, you're kind of defining you know, a network layer where you can do some interesting sort of overlay networking between things. So that, that's interesting. Um, I think that the interfaces for managing it are a bit 
flaky right now. You know, sort of the OpenStack Neutron is a fine as long as you've only got a few machines, and as soon as it gets to be too big, people stop using it because it doesn't really scale. So there's a bunch of problems like that with, with a lot of the SDN uh, models that are sort of data center oriented. But the, the general idea of you want to make the network infrastructure programmable um, is, is important, right? So there are certain things you really don't want to hide behind layers of firewalls and, and NAT and things like that. But, um, and you can do that programmatically. Um, you know, and the public clouds all have ways of doing that, and being able to do that in a data center is a, is a, good, you know, a good approach. OVN. I, have, I hadn't looked at OVN. But yeah. Okay. Any more questions? One more question. All right. So, um, great to end the night. So I'm a bit of a microservices skeptic. Uh -huh. which is increasingly unusual in this industry, I think. Um, in particular, so you had mentioned the smaller organizations and how they they deal with microservices before, and I noticed that there's a consistent theme running through your um, your descriptions of microservices of platform consistency and language consistency except the edges. Um, so what, just to describe the, to put the question in terms of context, uh, there are some startups, some smaller companies which hear about this pattern, do microservice architecture, and end up with a team of let's say six people with 19 microservices and uh, seven to 12 different programming languages, which, and there's a sort of death spiral that happens once you have that where the uh, shift the, the overhead of shifting between those sort of conceptual frameworks becomes really staggering and everyone spends all of their time rereading the man page for whichever compiler they're, mm -hmm. they're working with this week. Um, do you have any ideas in terms of like guidance for how uh, how consistent to make that that language and architecture level so that even though you might be working on different services that run on different processes, you're not really on a different infrastructure unless you're kind of sure. further out. And also, like, how big should uh, an individual service be so that people can get their head around a, a reasonably sized cluster of them and not have to um, reach, you know, 17 steps to get to the, the one object they're actually looking for? Right. So the question's about... Um, if you really let the microservices stuff get out of hand, you have too many versions of everything because you could, right? So there's, there's that tendency to go too far. Um, I think there's a couple of points there. The, there's a common platform in every system, which is that you need to find a service, dis there's a service discovery system, right? So you need a set of libraries that know how to find each other. Um, and then there's some common logging and analysis and monitoring stuff. So that tends to constrain the number of different patterns you have. Um, so Netflix originally Java-based, and then it was JVM-based, so you could do Groovy, and you can do Clojure, and you can do whatever, you know, Scala. Uh, but, it's, but you can still call into the same JVM. So the platform is a bunch of jar files, right? And regardless of what language you're using on top. And then a bunch of guys said, well, we really want to do stuff, just stuff in Python. So OK, you could do Python. So they built a bunch of Python interfaces that talk to the platform. Then they discovered the platform is evolving forward so fast that they were spending all their time updating these Python libraries. And, it be, and, and they realized just how much overhead it is to try and stay in sync uh, if you've got a rapidly evolving base platform. So keeping multiple language platforms in sync is a tax. So it's a bit like Apache. Anyone can fork Apache, but no one does because then you'd have to keep rebasing it to the original project. So the economic cost of forking the project is what stops you doing it. But you, but you, you buy into Apache because you could if you needed to, right? So, so it's a kind of a similar sort of thing. The cost of forking the platform is, is high. So you don't really want to, but you could. And if there's a really enough value, you can, and some people do, so that you get a number, you get a few sort of base platform libraries that, that are capable of, and there's enough investment. So the tooling ends up being sort of, okay, I have a nice clear path here that I created. And if you want to go foraging through the undergrowth, you can. And maybe you'll find out something interesting because closure is wonderful or something, whatever. So you go off and find something, you figure out the tooling for that, and it's so cool that a bunch of friends help doing it, and you clear a path, right? So if you don't clear a path, that is like a set of patterns and tooling, 
then you're, you know, you're just a loner, right? And so if, if you end up with a bunch of loners, then it's going to be difficult because you're like wandering randomly. So, so you want to have uh, the tooling and the platform be patterns that create sort of beaten tracks through all of the different options. So there's too many ways to do everything, right? So you want to have standard ways of doing it that people can learn and that can copy and it becomes easier. I just have a problem to solve. Okay, everyone else is, this is the standard tooling to do it. So, that, so th there's a natural way that people will just end up following a, a path, right? So, you, so when you're creating new, but you don't prevent people from, create, from trying new paths. So that's the way innovation happens, and that's why new languages come into the system and new, new tools and new ways of doing things. So you want to let it evolve, um, but there is a cost of being the first person to try something. Um, so sometimes you start explicit Pathfinder projects to go try something differently. Sometimes it's hack days where somebody goes off and does something weird and people say, that looked cool, and then more people pile in. Right? So, the, so I think that that's the way to think about it. Um, certainly having everyone in a company use a different language and different tooling is not going to be a particularly helpful outcome, I think. So, so in that sense, you can go too far. Cool. All right. So it's like ants, basically. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Do you see that video of those ants? There was some sort of millipede, and there was this whole pile of ants dragging this thing that was <laughs> a hundred times bigger than an ant. And it was one of those videos that comes by on Facebook occasionally. They were ganging up on it. It's <laughs> amazing. So what happens when you when everyone collectively knows what they're supposed to be doing and they just mm -hmm. blindly act, dragging cool. this thing? We're going to solve this problem together. That's motivational. Yeah, motivational. <laughs> Pretend you're ants dragging a millipede. There you go. Cool. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> we'll end on that note. <laughs> <laughs> Have some more beer. Thank you.